Good afternoon. I'm Linda Dixon of the Lexington Veterans Association, and I welcome you to a program on the Battle of the Gauntlet. We will revisit the icy landscape of South Korea, where the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division fought for its life against overwhelming numbers of Chinese infantry. We extend a warm welcome to our fellow veterans at the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital who are watching this program via Zoom. It is my pleasure to introduce an old friend of the Lexington Veterans Association, Dan Green. Dan Green grew up in Atlanta, where he developed a passion for history and the Civil War in particular. He earned a BA in history from the University of Wisconsin and a law degree from the University of Georgia. After briefly practicing law, he earned a master's degree in history from the University of Georgia and a PhD from Boston College. He taught history at Framingham State College and Newbury College before joining the faculty of Brandeis University, where he is a senior lecturer, legal studies. And Dan was very supportive of our conducting this veterans tribute, even if it meant starting his talk a bit late. Please welcome Dan Breen. Let's see how we do. Can you hear me if I talk like that? Yeah. That's not too bad. All right. Uh, so here's my clicker. And with any luck, we'll get to the map here, which will allow us to bring up to begin our presentation today. And that was a very moving tribute. Thank you for letting me be uh, a witness to that. And I'd just like to add my own two cents, perhaps just to begin, that uh, anybody involved in any way with the Korean conflict, 1950 to 1953, uh, has reason to be very, very proud of their sacrifices in their service. Uh, because what that conflict allowed to exist, of course, was nothing less than the Republic of South Korea today. And because of their sacrifices and service, there are tens of millions of people living in freedom and prosperity today that would be in slavery, a word not for what they did at the beginning of the 1950s. South Korea is an economic miracle, 10th uh, biggest economy in the world. It's one of the most vibrant democracies in the world. It has a culture that influences people all over the globe. And none of that would have been possible without what uh, our veterans did. Uh, the sacrifice uh, really sh should never be forgotten. And what I'd like to talk about today is an episode of that war uh, from the American perspective, maybe one of the low points of that war. And uh, that was the events of the uh, fall of 1950, at which point uh, UN armies had advanced north of the 38th parallel, remember, following the successful Incheon landings of September of 1950. So we begin our story in October of 1950. And at that point, uh, elements of the 8th Army, US forces had captured Yongyang in conjunction with our South Korean allies uh, our early uh, October of 1950. And then the idea was to advance north of Yongyang, eventually get to the Yalu River and end the war. So if our pointer works, uh, maybe we can see just where we are. Uh, there's Yongyang around there. And uh, all they had to do is advance a little bit further. There's the Yalu. And we're going to be hearing about this river here. Uh, that's the Chongqing River. We'll get back to that in a second. They had to get beyond that river to the Yalu. And then that would be it. Everybody could come home uh, after a job very well done. And then all of a sudden, something unexpected happened. Uh, elements of the 1st Cavalry Division advanced north of Yongyang. They got to a place called Unsan at the end of October 1950. And at that point, all of a sudden, they were struck by very strong forces indeed. Not the North Koreans, but somebody they weren't expecting to see. That is the Chinese Army, or as Mao called it, the PVA, People's Volunteer Army, struck them in great numbers, especially at the beginning of 1950. And all of a sudden, surrounded as they were by vast numbers of Chinese, it was all the 1st Cavalry Division, elements of it at least, could do to fight for their lives and somehow get self to safety. Many of them were captured in that terrible battle of Unsan, 
But uh, and among those who were captured was this man here. Uh, that's a Roman Catholic chaplain, Emil Kaplan, as uh, some of you may have heard of him. Wounded at Unsan very badly, but despite his wounds, he kept caring for the other wounded all around him in the face of very confusing combat. And even though he was repeatedly wounded, he would not go to safety as the rest of his outfit was trying to get self eventually to uh, the rest of the 8th Army. He stayed where he was to care for the wounded, even though he knew he was going to go into captivity because he did that. And when they were surrounded by that Chinese taken into captivity, he actually carried somebody despite his wounds almost all the way to Manchuria. Emil Kaplan would die in early 1951 of his wounds and privations as a prisoner of the Chinese, uh, but he would get the Medal of Honor for what he did. And his remains were only returned to his native Can Kansas in 2021. They had a big ceremony for him, uh, very well deserved indeed. Well, what had just happened? MacArthur's headquarters, conveniently in Tokyo, believed that this was a very limited show of force by the Chinese that elements of the first cab had just been uh, stricken by. The incompetent head of US intelligence, a guy named Charles Willoughby, estimated that there could not be more than 40,000 Chinese around the Chungcheng River south of the Yalu. So what they were worried about, whoops, uh, this area here, uh, around the Chongqing River, and uh, according to Willoughby, maybe 40,000 Chinese, a little bit, perhaps maybe not much more than that, south of the Yalu. Observers, advisors, not much more than that. But at the time of Unsan, there were 250,000 Chinese between the Chongqing and the Yalu. And there'd be way more than that by Thanksgiving of 1950. Willoughby, the intelligence guy, had reason to know this. There were plenty of reports coming in from the guys on the ground about how many Chinese there were north of Yongyang, but he ignored that information because that's not what MacArthur wanted to hear. Willoughby's idea of what intelligence ought to be was tell your commander what he wants to hear, and that was MacArthur. And so all anybody knew around Willoughby's headquarters, 40,000 Chinese, no more than that. But MacArthur and Willoughby were not the only ones at fault for what was about to follow. There are warnings coming in from the government of India that the Chinese were willing to go into North Korea with both feet to prevent the Americans from getting any further towards the Yalu, north of Yongyang. But Secretary of State Dean Acheson refused to believe those reports. He referred to them as mere vaporings, even though that was awfully good intelligence. And that's why less than three weeks after the defeat at Unsan, the 15,000 men of the 2nd Infantry Division, the Indian Head Division, uh, and now the spearhead of the 8th Army, was arrayed along the Chongchun River, which runs northwest to southeast uh, towards the LOC, south of the Yalu, preparing to spring from there towards the Yalu to maybe finally win the war, maybe uh, by Christmas, if all went well. And I believe Captain Flynn of Lexington was a member of the 2nd Infantry, yes, right? Yes, he was. Yeah, uh, that's the uh, Indian Head Division. You can see their famous insignia, it's the upper left over here on our picture. And uh, here's where they were. Uh, that's the Chongchun, and they're arrayed here in this part of the Chongchun River, all set to go north uh, about 50 miles to the Yalu. Home by Christmas, that was the idea. They had a hot meal at Thanksgiving as all US troops traditionally do. That was the day of rest, November 23rd. The next day was November 24th. The 8th Army began moving north. The 2nd Infantry began crossing the Chongqing River. Far across the mountains to the east, of course, was the 1st Marine Division. They might as well have been at Camp Pendleton. Too many mountains between them and the 8th Army. Nobody could support each other. And that's exactly what the Chinese were gambling on that the two great elements of the UN forces would have no way of coming to each other's aid if there was a massive attack on both of them. Twice this opportunity for the Chinese. Not much happened on November 24th. But the next day, November 25th, as temperatures along the Chongqing River plummeted to 20 below zero, the division's 9th Regiment, now north of the Chongqing, ran into heavy Chinese resistance and then at night, all hell broke loose. 
Chinese bugles blared in the darkness. In an instant, waves and waves of Chinese infantry went on the attack, uh, hurling grenades at the 9th Regiment and, in addition, firing their famous Burke guns at anybody they could see in the darkness, that Soviet-made weapon that was all too effective at close quarters. The darkness prevented any effective air support on the night of uh, the 25th, uh, and all around the men, some of them surrounded now on the hills above the Changchun, were the yells of the Chinese. They knew enough English to say, we will kill you, GI. We will kill you tonight, GI. And to make matters worse, the hilly terrain up there, north of the Changchun, meant that if a company was on this hill, they would have no idea what was going on on a hill nearby. The acoustics just weren't right. It was difficult to support one another and all the confusion. And whenever they could, Chinese infantrymen swarmed over Sherman tanks, sometimes with satchels of TNT, sometimes wrenching their hatches open if they could, tossing grenades into the tank crew below. And all through that confusing night of the 25th, men of the 9th Regiment, elements of the 38th Regiment of the 2nd Division, crossed and recrossed the Chanshan River, seeking safety, going back to the counterattack, with uh, their commander, Major General Dutch Kieser, wondering what on earth was going on now. Nobody was expecting this, among the division commanders at least. And in truth, it was hard to say where the rear was. Front, rear, sideways, there seemed to be Chinese everywhere. And they were south of the Changchun River now as well, attacking 2nd Infantry artillery positions, where the artillerymen had to fight them hand to hand sometimes with rifle butts to keep them away. The next day was November 26th, equally confused, equally chaotic. And on that day, the 23rd Regiment, three regiments of the 2nd Infantry, this is the, the 23rd, uh, they were dug in here, a place called uh, Kujangdong. His commander was Colonel Paul Freeman. There he is, that's Colonel Freeman. And he didn't like this one bit. Uh, here's what his men were faced with, swarming Chinese, seemingly on all sides. The question is, what was to be done? The last thing he wanted was a fight with superior Chinese forces in this remote area with his supply line consisting of one thin road stretching down from Kujang to Kunuri to a place called Sunchan. So that's the road we're talking about here that we're going to be seeing a lot of goes down here uh, to Kunuri and then snakes like this to Sunchan. Sunchan is the uh, supply depot. Uh, and that's what they all depend on. Now look how long and thin that is. That's 13 miles from Kunuri. Uh, Colonel Freeman in the 23rd Regiment, they're here. Not a good situation to be in at all. And what made it worse for him, as he tried to figure out what are we gonna do, counterattack, ask for a retreat, what's our next move? What made it worse for him was that all the way to the south, whoops, and to the east, Elements of the South Korean army that were supposed to be guarding the flank were also under very heavy attack by the Chinese. And many of them were not up to the task of holding that flank. Many of them broke and ran. And there was nothing unexpected about that. A lot of these South Koreans had had 10 days of training. Uh, they were draftees thrown into the line with hardly any training at all. Of course, they're going to retreat when faced with uh, elements of a all of a sudden appearing Chinese army that outnumbered them five or six to one. Their flanks were now in trouble, the second infantry, their rear was in trouble. And in only 24 hours, by November 26th, the second division, the Indian head division, had gone from a confident feeling that they were about to win the war to a state of affairs that threatened complete disaster. At least as long as there was daylight, here's a, a rare bright side, the uh, P-51s, the B-26 that we uh, heard about just a few minutes ago, they could come in with bombing runs. That's a P-51, temporarily blunting the Chinese attacks through the use of the truly terrifying weapon of napalm. But that afternoon, Colonel Freeman decided the only way to maybe save some of the situation was to launch limited counter-strikes to keep the ch uh, Chinese off balance. And during one of those counter-attacks, this is November 26th, the Americans attacked a place called Hill 321, 329. So one of the squads made their way up that hill, the snow in the cold, Hill 329. 
And as they did so, under Chinese machine gun fire, a Chinese grenade landed right in the middle of them. Immediately, their commander, Sergeant John Pittman of Carrollton, Mississippi, leapt on top of that grenade and absorbed the blast. When the medic got to him on the slopes of Hill 329, a long way from Carrollton, Mississippi, uh, Pittman's very first words were, is anybody else hurt? Didn't ask about himself at all. And he somehow survived that. I uh, was awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, lived to a ripe old age back in Mississippi, uh, only died during the 1990s. For the most part though, now, the second division was on the defensive. And that November 26th, its commander, General Lawrence Kieser, Dutch Kieser, was getting very concerned with a looming disaster in his rear and to his right, where the South Koreans were in retreat. Who was gonna hold the flank? How were they gonna get to safety? That night, there were more massive attacks, more swarms of Chinese, bugles blaring, this time coming from the east below the Chongchun River, supposedly in their rear. And remarkably, one of the companies that was cut off in the darkness during that confused fight south of the Chongchun in the 38th Regiment, finding out perhaps that they were now lost, nowhere to get contact with the rest of the 38th Regiment, they had to depend upon a prisoner they take, a Chinese prisoner who seemed to speak perfect English. And this guy said, I'll tell you where to go, follow me. And he led them in the darkness, in the circuitous route among the hills, and they had no choice but to follow him. There's over 100 guys in the company following this Chinese prisoner. Uh, and he did lead them to safety, to the rest of the 2nd Division. And the company commander uh, couldn't understand how this could have happened. And it turned out that the prisoner was armed all the time. Nobody took away his burp gun. Uh, he was still underneath his padded jacket the whole time. He could have gotten away. So they asked him, why did you do that? And he said, I went to UCLA. <laughs> he, said, he was a graduate of UCLA. Uh, and he said, uh, uh, Mao came to get me. I didn't want to go. They, they conscripted me in from my village. They said they'd kill my family if I didn't join up. So here I am, and now here you are. Night fell, sun came up. Now it's November 27th. The second infantry division was still holding its ground along the Chongchun with uh, increasingly bad conditions to the rear and to the east. The real threat was really down there, to the east and to the rear, because behind the retreating Koreans were at least 60,000 Chinese soldiers, outnumbering the 2nd Division 4 to 1. They were making their way over the hills towards the road to Sunshan. Whoops, again, uh, this, this road here. Yeah. If they cut that road, that would be it. Uh, the second infantry could be surrounded, maybe destroyed uh, in detail. One obstacle trying to hold that road, keeping the Chinese away, uh, was the 38th Regiment of the 2nd Division. They were desperately trying to hold their ground a little bit to the east of the road. It was becoming more and more difficult for them. And General Walker, who is the commander of the 8th Army, was about to give the order for everybody to fall back. Everybody fall back. Uh, this was a, a different war, as MacArthur said. Nobody knew how to deal with all these Chinese who were all of a sudden in it. The only thing to do, he thought, was regroup, fall back. Not a bad idea, especially since the Marines on the other side of the mountains were similarly beleaguered along the famous Jozon Reservoir. Now when they have the attack, anybody could see that Chinese were now in the war with both feet. But inexplicably, General Walker gave little thought to reinforcing the beleaguered 2nd Infantry, who so far have been doing most of the fighting uh, along the Chongchun River. All he did to reinforce them was send the 5,000 men of the Turkish Division, who had joined UN forces a little bit earlier. 5,000 men to hold back 60,000 Chinese. Uh, one historian describes that as taking uh, a top of an aspirin bottle and using that to cork a beer keg. That's what it was like. So the Turks, who had not been in combat since World War I, uh, their brigade went up the road, took up blocking positions to the east of the vital lifeline to Sunshan to try to hold up the Chinese. And at one point, they radioed the world. They'd won a great victory. They'd taken 200 Chinese prisoners. But the prisoners they took were actually South Koreans. <laughs> not a victory. <laughs> 
And instead, they were now heavily attacked. They did the best they could. There were stories of uh, Turkish commanders taking their hats off, throwing them in the road and saying, here we fight, here we die. But very soon, 20% of them were casualties. They were completely outnumbered. They had really no choice. And they began streaming off to the west, past the Sunshan Road. That blocking position wasn't going to work. And it was more of the same on November 28th. The next day, uh, General Kieser was now doing his best to consolidate the 2nd Infantry, uh, at least in Kunu Ri. Remember, uh, right there, get all these three regiments together. Uh, at least that way they could put up a better fight while they awaited orders. Uh, two of the regiments, the 23rd and the 38th, were pretty battered. But the other one, the 9th, who had been fighting north of the Chongchun, uh, they were in terrible shape. Something had to be done to get these guys out. Unbeknownst to Kieser, the, the Turks had already been forced to retreat. There's nothing holding off the Chinese to the rear and especially to the east. His flank was mostly exposed now. Nobody's getting any sleep, especially none of the 38th. Uh, which was under the biggest attack at this point, a little bit east of the road. Three Chinese divisions were attacking the 38th Regiment. The MASH unit at Kunu Ri was overwhelmed with wounded. It was so cold by now that intravenous fluids at the MASH unit were frozen solid. And the nurses would no sooner boil water to sterilize surgical equipment before bits of ice would form on the surface. But it was there at Kunu Ri that Keys would concentrate the division. And all that day, dirty, unshaven, exhausted men trudged down the road parallel to the Chongchen to get to Kunu Ri, 15 miles in some cases. And on their right, the 38th did their best to hold that part of the line, slowly giving ground, getting back to Kunu Ri, often stalled by the wreckage of vehicles that the Turks had left behind. At one point on the road, there was a burning Sherman. Uh, and the other Shermans coming up the road couldn't figure out how to get that out of the way. It was burning, it was very dangerous. Uh, so this tank commander named Peroni, he was in the lead Sherman, how are we going to get past this tank on the road? We've got to get to Kunu Ri. And he had the idea of turning the turret around and then getting everybody out of the tank, sending the tank down the hill with the uh, cannon pointing the other way. It crashed at the bottom of this hill but they could still get it going at the bottom of it. They got back in the tank and then took it up the hill on the other side of the Sherman and got to safety that way. But everybody had their own story about how they're gonna get back to Kungu Ri. Meanwhile, off to the west, the entire 8th Army was also in retreat. And Kieser's idea, now it's the 28th, his idea was we gotta do the same thing. We've gotta get out of here. And what he wanted to do on November 29th was take that road, take that road down to Sunshan in safety. There was a unit of the British Brigade, a little bit north of Sunshan, holding the road there. If they could get to the British, they'd be okay. And he wanted to do it on the 29th. But General Walker, commander of the 8th Army, wouldn't hear of it. The 2nd Infantry had to stay in Kunu Ri, at least on the 29th, to protect the retreat of the rest of the 8th Army to the west. And that was a fateful decision. For that day, the 29th, a day the 2nd Infantry could have retreated down the road, on that day, the Chinese established blocking positions along the one major road to Sunshan. Not literally a roadblock. Uh, they had machine gun positions, mortar positions in the hills on either side, especially the eastern side. But that's all they needed. They could rain havoc on anybody going down that road. 60,000 Chinese troops in the neighborhood now. And they masked their movements when they attacked at Kunu Ri. And when they moved through the hills that afternoon by setting the forest on fire wherever they could. And that meant the P-51s couldn't do much about them as they went looking for targets. Finally, at 5 p.m. on the 29th, the order came down from Walker to retreat down the road the next day, the 30th. And the higher-ups assured Major General Kieser, you're not going to have a problem. The road's open. The reality was the situation was now desperate. By the time the order came down, thousands of Chinese had occupied the hills on both sides of the road. Wrecked vehicles, some of them left by the Turks, some of them American supply vehicles, destroyed by the Chinese, were littering the road, making it difficult for anything with wheels to get down that road to Sunshan. This is an idea about what the road looked like. You can see it's very narrow. We would call it maybe a lane and a half. There's hills on either side, 
many Chinese, especially on the left-hand side on the east, and that's the road they're going to have to take under the guns of the People's Volunteer Army. So the orders were issued. On the 30th, Colonel Freeman's 23rd Regiment would stay at Kunuri for most of the day as a rear guard, while the battered 9th Regiment in the almost as battered went down the road to Sunchan. No sooner had Kieser given the order of march on the evening of the 29th than his command post at Kunuri came under a major sustained attack. He had to work out the logistics under the noise and the danger of mortar fire all through that evening. And the next day was the 30th, the day of the retreat. The men of the 23rd Regiment at Kunuri watched as their comrades began to march south, the 9th followed by the 38th. The higher ground will be on their left. And by now they all knew there were Chinese between them and Sunshan. Nobody knew how many. They had to get six miles. Six miles down the road is where the British were, a position called Nottingham in safety. Maybe there'd be just a few. Maybe they could be brushed aside. And ideally, if you look at the picture, uh, the 9th Regiment, the lead regiment, would have had flanking parties up in those hills, uh, making sure that there weren't any Chinese that are fired down on the road. But the 9th was too badly hurt for that. One of their battalions came into the battle with 970 men. They were down to less than 200. They didn't have the men for proper flanking parties. So all they could do was march. They got about a mile down the road, they turned to bend on the road to Sunshan, and there in front of them were massed wrecked vehicles, some belonging to the Turkish Brigade. The column stopped, and then all of a sudden, there came the sound of those bugles, and then came machine gun fire from both sides of the road, and before they knew it, some of their own vehicles had been hit, were on fire, were stalled. Uh, they could push some of them in the drainage ditches on both sides, some of them were harder to push, and in the noise and the confusion, their officers could not organize a coherent response. What are we going to do? They had to keep moving. They had to keep moving at all costs. Uh, and General Kieser had the presence of mind to send five Sherman tanks down that road to try to bulldoze as many vehicles as they could uh, off to the side on the drainage ditches. And those five Shermans began to roll down the road, uh, always under fire, mortar fire, for example. Uh, and they began bulldozing these vehicles and at one point, they got to a pretty large vehicle. It's an M39 utility vehicle blocking the road. Uh, and they tried to bulldoze that away. But they were having trouble because the tracks were locked. Uh, tracks were moving. What were they going to do? Uh, Lieutenant Heath, Lieutenant Charles Heath, he's riding on top of one of the Shermans. And he got out. And he's going to try to fix the lever of the tracks of the utility vehicle to get it going the right way so they could more easily push it off. But he didn't know how to do it. So under fire, the tank commander and that particular Sherman began shouting over Chinese fire as if he's telling you how to put something together from Ikea. Do this, do this, do this. And Lieutenant Heath is down there doing this, doing this. They got the lever working. Uh, they got that thing off the road. And they kept going. They got uh, 30 vehicles off the road and the six miles down to Nottingham. But as they're going towards the British, the last stretch of the road terrified them. It was narrow, the hills were higher, perfect ambush decision uh, place. Chinese, especially on the eastern side of the road, were firing at them. And that was the part of the road to Sunshan that became known as the pass, the most dangerous part of the road of all, uh, directly to the north of where the British were, uh, begging for an ambush. And the Shermans who got through were very worried about what was about to happen to anybody following them. And they had a right to be worried. It wasn't long before the column behind them was stopped again. More trucks were hit, more jeeps were hit by the Chinese. Men organized small parties to push stuff off the road when they could. But what really made the difference in the first two miles uh, south of Kunuri was one guy who was an MP named Bob Kieser, sergeant, no relation to the general. When he heard what was going on, he literally ran two miles from Kunuri down the road. And he started to give directions. You push this, you push that. They began to get vehicles off the road. He began acting like a traffic cop. He was shot at, he was re wounded more than once, but he kept directing traffic for two hours on that side of the road. And for many men in the 2nd Infantry, the thing they remember 
about that terrible day, among many others, was that MP directing traffic. This, like this. Seemed to know exactly what it was doing. And he lived through it, despite his wounds. And he moved to California. He opened up a Western-style souvenir store. He was on the rodeo circuit for a while. And everybody called him Cowboy Bob Keezer. And that's Cowboy Bob. Uh, he was a chain smoker all his life, uh, lived to the age of 82, uh, won the Distinguished Service Cross, although posthumously, unfortunately. Uh, and he was the man who helped save the Second Infantry on that road. Uh, if there was any command at all, it was Cowboy Bob uh, for the first few miles of the retreat. But the going was slow, and those wrecked vehicles were at the end of it. Every mile of the gauntlet was a fire zone, getting down to Nottingham. At all costs, everybody had to keep moving. If there were bodies on the road, they couldn't stop to decide if it was dead or wounded. They could only drive over them. A truck filled with wounded men was struck by Chinese machine gun fire. The truck in back of them, the guys wanted to get out, see who they could rescue. The officer said, get back in the truck, get back in the truck, we've got to keep going. And they watched helplessly as men died in the truck caught on fire. The only chance we've got, the officer said, was to keep this damn column moving. Everywhere there were piles of flaming debris. More and more men lay dead on the road or in the ditches. Hardly any concentrated, unified command at all now. Small units making the best way they could down towards Sun Chan, fighting back the best they could. Uh, if they were riding on a tank, they had to get off the tank when the Sherman had a target to fire at. Sometimes the Sherman would just keep going. Once they stopped firing, the men were now on foot. They tried to hitch a ride on something else. And it was like that for mile after mile down what now began to be called the gauntlet, as it indeed was. And they had to get to Nottingham. They had to get six miles down the road. And again, the worst of it was through the pass right north of where the British were. No place to hide, no way through. And General Keyser himself was down in the pass by now. Uh, he was acting like a lieutenant. He was directing fire from small units here, here, uh, small-scale counterattacks, because there was no way to exercise any kind of a unified command the way a major general would like. Uh, he was in it like everybody else. And at one point, he's walking along in the pass, and he accidentally kicked somebody, kicked a wounded man. And the wounded man yelled at him, you goddamn SOB. And of course, there was no reprimand from Keyser. It's not the kind of situation he understood completely. Some of the men began making it through on foot some of them so badly wounded that the British officers who were responsible for the medical tent at Nottingham, uh, one of them had a nervous breakdown because of the wounds he was seeing by the men who got through the pass, those who were able to get through. Others did not even try to get through the pass on the afternoon of November 30th. They decided to go across country, take their chances of looting the Chinese on either side of the road. And one group of 20 men was led by Charles Rangel. Wrangell, who became a congressman from New York eventually. And Charlie Wrangell uh, led 20 men around the Chinese. They got to safety. He was an artilleryman. Uh, and he would talk about that for the rest of his life. He always said, uh, I've never had a bad day since November 30th, 1950, because nothing could compare to that. Last bad day I ever had in my life. Now, while all this was going on, get back to my pointer, uh, and things were getting worse in the gauntlet, as a second infantry, the two regiments were trying to get through. Uh, Colonel Freeman was still back here in Kunuri. He's got the rear guard. The afternoon is advancing. And he's got a decision to make. Based on what he was beginning to hear about those six miles of road down to Nottingham, he had no reason to think the 23rd Regiment would ever get there by sundown. Things were awful there. But he knew there was another way out. And General Keyser had known that too. Back on the 29th, General Keyser had contacted the higher ups, Corps Command uh, under the 8th Army, and he suggested this, why do we need to go down the road to Sunshan anyway? Why can't we take this road? And you get to the same place. It's longer, but far fewer Chinese. And he was told, by his corps commander, you can't do that. The 25th Division is using that road. It's not in your sector. He's got to follow orders. He's just the division commander. So that's why they went through the gauntlet. 
But Colonel Freeman knew about that road too. He had no orders to take it. He had no authority to take that road. But to his everlasting credit, he decided to take the road. He's not going to go through the gauntlet. He's going to save these guys. They're going to go towards Anjou and then south to Sun Chan that way. He had most of the division artillery with him at Kunuri. And the artillery guys didn't think they could take everything out with them. They were very worried about that. And it was good that they decided not to load everything up right away. Because as the sun was coming down and Colonel Freeman was getting ready to take everybody out on the Anjou Road, abandoning Kunuri, they could see in front of them on the hillsides just south of the Chongchun, north of Kunuri, a new swarm of Chinese infantry attacking them in one great last ditch effort to take Kunuri before Freeman could get out of there. Freeman saw it along with everybody else and he began shouting, get the goddamn guns in a firing position. And he ordered the artillery to fire off all the shells they could. They fired off 3,200 rounds, eight rounds per gun per minute in one great shattering bombardment in the direction of the advancing Chinese. Everybody helped load those shells left in Kunuri. Cooks loaded them, typists loaded them, and the pieces were firing so hot that the paint was peeling. And when that was done, they destroyed as many houses as they could as the Chinese attack was blunted, and Freeman began yelling, let's get the hell out, get the hell out of here, let's, don't stop. And off they went to the southwest towards Anjou. They had to leave a lot of the artillery behind, they had to destroy what they could. Uh, but the men got out, almost unscathed, with Colonel Freeman being just where he was supposed to be, as David Halberstam says in his famous book of the Korean War, uh, The Coldest Winter, he was just where a regimental command commander ought to be. He was on the last jeep out of Kunuri. Uh, he didn't leave before everybody else left. But not everybody got out, because just to the east of Kunuri was the second combat engineers. Some of them were on the road to Sun Chan, but some of them were left in Kunuri, and not all of them got the word that it was time to leave. They were stuck where they were, they were surrounded, and in the evening, the sundown, they were being overrun. They had to surrender. So what their battalion commander ordered was that their colors, the uh, second combat engineer colors, be burned. Uh, the flag and the streamers by the flag all burned so the Chinese wouldn't get a hand on their flag. And then they surrendered and they went into captivity. And that episode is reenacted every single year by the second combat engineers. Uh, this is the second combat engineers in Afghanistan recently. Every November 30th, they have a ceremonial burning of the colors, uh, a unique episode in the US Army to commemorate that terrible night when so many of their men burned the colors and then went into a horrible captivity in Manchuria. Now, by that time, as we begin to close, things were at their very worst in the gauntlet. Now it's after dark. Kieser and his men had bulldozed a bunch of jeeps off and smaller vehicles off, so some of the vehicles were now getting through the pass, but they couldn't get all of them out. And to the north of them on the road, uh, things were at their worst. Uh, there were artillery men and engineers there, uh, trapped further up, and in the bitter cold and pitch darkness, some of the artillery guys uh, unlimbered the 105 millimeter howitzers and began trying to fire up in the hills. But by this time, the Chinese were down on the road itself, and there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And there's one episode where an artilleryman uh, actually see if he could get a hold of a dog tag of the person he was fighting with, just to make sure that wasn't an American he was about to kill. It was that dark and so confused on the road. Many of the guys on the road now figured, we're gonna get captured, we're not gonna make it through. It's too late, it's too dark. And those are the ones who especially made it up into the hills and tried to get back anywhere they could, away from the road. Uh, one group of 200 was led by a sergeant, a guy named Piazza. And he wasn't in command of 200 guys, uh, but he was the only one who seemed to be very confident about reading the stars. And he knew where south was. So he began to lead them to the west and then to the south, uh, and they all followed him, and a lieutenant showed up. Uh, Sergeant, uh, per, uh, Sergeant Piazza said, uh, would you like to take command? Lieutenant said, no, you're, you're doing fine. You, you, you keep it up. Uh, and they were fine. They got to safety. Another group of 100, though, not so lucky. They were led by a lieutenant uh, who led them the wrong way, led them north, uh, which is where they weren't supposed to be going. 
and, they, and they realized their mistake when the sun came up. Uh, it was dawn, and these, there's a hundred of them, and they could see Chinese positions down there in this little crossroads, a tiny little village. And they had this idea, maybe they won't notice us. If we just keep going, maybe we'll just walk through like we own the place, maybe they won't notice us. They wanted to get to a tunnel, maybe they could get through the tunnel, maybe that would lead somewhere. But they were noticed. The Chinese opened fire, a bunch of them were cut down, the rest were taken prisoner. A hundred men tried to get to the tunnel, and we know that only four survived the war. Uh, only four survived captivity, injuries, and death uh, that day. Uh, on, this actually December 1st of 1950. But it was that night, November 30th, 1951, 1950, to December 1st, 1950, that Walter Winchell made his famous broadcast where he told the people of the United States, if you have a son in the 2nd Infantry Division, pray for him. If you have a son in the 2nd Infantry, pray for him. Well, most of the 2nd Infantry did get through uh, by dawn on December 1st, but the Chinese had killed or captured almost a third of the 2nd Infantry. Almost 5,000 men killed, badly wounded, or captured by the Chinese. They lost most of their artillery, and General Keyser, I think rather unfairly, lost his command because of this. I say unfairly because he wanted to take that other road uh, through Anjou down to Sunchon that, that way. It wasn't his fault that intelligence was so awful among the higher ups. He didn't know what hit him. He had no reason to know what hit him. But he was told five days after reaching safety at Sunchon, he was told by the higher ups, uh, you just came down with pneumonia uh, and you've got to give up your command. He protested, but what could he do? He was replaced. He wasn't the only one who was bitterly uh, unhappy about what had happened. Uh, Colonel Peplo was the commander of the 38th Regiment. Uh, as he was watching his guys uh, in the evening of the 29th, uh, in the evening of the 30th, I should say, coming into Nottingham, the British position, uh, he began openly weeping to see how many were badly wounded, thinking about how many weren't gonna get through. Uh, and it was, it was so awful for him, he couldn't stop weeping. So his subordinate actually took a helmet and put it up in front of his face. So his men couldn't see him crying, couldn't see their colonel crying as they came into the Nottingham position. So the casualties of the second infantry were awful in this battle, but most of the division did get through. And the fact is that they inflicted roughly 10 times the casualties on the Chinese than they received themselves. If you count the action along the Chongchun, right before the retreat of the gauntlet, uh, the Chinese lost uh, very nearly uh, 10 times the casualties that they inflicted on the 2nd Infantry. Mostly wounded, but very grievous nonetheless. Very, very high casualty rate indeed. And the fact is that they were so badly hurt and their supply situation was so terrible by December 1st that they were in no position to go on the offensive again. Not until early in 1951. Were they going to be able to go on the offensive again? But nobody knew that. Nobody knew how badly the Chinese had been hurt. And so General Walker continued with his fateful order to abandon North Korea. And thus began the longest retreat to this day in US military history, often called the Great Bug Out, from the Chongqing River all the way south of Seoul. There's a persistent idea to this day that the Chinese were so badly hurt that if Walker had tried to hold a line from Yongyang uh, off to the east towards Hunan, where the Marines were, then maybe that would have made a difference. Maybe that would be part of South Korea to this day. But that's 2020 hindsight. All he knew was how badly the 8th Army had been hurt. The time was to get south of the 38th parallel and regroup, uh, which they did. That's General Keyser, uh, who never had a combat command after the Battle of the Gauntlet. And uh, this is what would happen to many of his soldiers who found themselves now in Manchuria. A lot of them died on the way to Manchuria. They didn't have proper clothing. It was bitterly cold. If they didn't keep moving all the time, they had no chance at all. And for many of them, if they were wounded, they couldn't keep moving all the time. Uh, many of them died. Uh, and in fact, 40% of all US POWs died in Chinese captivity. Uh, miserably high POW death rate uh, after 1950. But those who survived in the second infantry lived to fight another day, and they did. And under the command of Colonel Freeman, the 23rd Regiment, in early 1951, 
would fight and win the famous Battle of Chipyongni, often called the Gettysburg of the Korean War, uh, where the Chinese were not just halted, but they were pushed back. And that was the beginning of the end of the favorable situation that led to the truce of 1953. Uh, so the Indian head division wasn't thrown out of Korea by any means. They stayed where they were. They played a big role in the eventual series of victories that culminated in the truce of 1953. And of course, just to end things, they're still there. Uh, the second infantry is the primary US outfit in Korea to this day, the Indian Head Division. And they're very proud of the fact that the only South Koreans who are official full-fledged members of the US military are associated with the second infantry. Those are the Katusas. And many South Koreans really want to be Katusas because they get training, they get good schooling uh, under the second infantry. And uh, they often get really good jobs. Once they come out of it, they learn English a lot better. Uh, so the tradition continues. Uh, the second infantry, uh, not too far away from Chip Young Ni to this day, uh, where they helped stem the advance uh, of the Chinese army and paved the way for what I consider to be one of the great success stories of the 20th century and the 21st century, the ongoing wonder that is free democratic South Korea. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. It was an uh, honor to see you. Well, thank you, Dan. Now, we are ready to accept questions. And Susan, you'll check the Zoom, will you? Yes, we do have one from Zoom. And uh, yeah, we actually have some experts in the front row on this, so I, that's correct. I feel sheepers. Anyone well. who wishes to ask a question, you have to wait to get the microphone because you're all being recorded. So. Raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you. We have our first question. I, just a general question of, you know, the Chinese came in. Yeah. And here we are fighting. <clears throat> Was there something that kept us from doing anything outside of that little line, not the big line, against the Chinese? The reason I bring this up is <clears throat> when I was in the service, I was in the sub, and you do yeah. a lot of talking. I mean, you go on a 90 day patrol, there's not a heck of a lot of things you do. So we chatted, and some of the older, call them oldest chiefs, they were probably 30 years old, and <laughs> the older guys on board were talking about when they were on a sub around the Korean War. And they said, you know, they came across, they would see these ships, Chinese ships, clearly loaded with stuff for North Korea. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, we got to pull the trigger, and they're gone. But it was a no-no. You couldn't do anything like that, which seems, I don't know, yeah, yeah, that, that's a little curious. I mean, to talk about a military asset, you've got ships resupplying your troops in North Korea, but there was a lot of nervousness in the high command about doing anything like that. The, MacArthur had bombed some of the Yale bridges, but they didn't want to go much further than that because everybody knew that Stalin was behind the Chinese. Uh, and what nobody knew was that Stalin had told Mao that if you get into trouble there, you can't depend on me. But all anybody knew was that Stalin had okayed this invasion. They had assumed he had, which indeed he had. So if uh, we were to escalate the war in any way against the Chinese, maybe to the extent of attacking their naval assets, the fear was that would trigger another Soviet move, which of course was, isn't what anybody wanted. And you would err on the side of caution, which was not good for anybody involved on the ground, of course. So that's probably the only explanation I can see for that. But the irony, of course, was that uh, Russians were in the fight. Russians were piloting MiGs for a while. We were actually shooting at them. Yeah. Susan, I believe we have a, a question from our Zoom audience. Yes. So why was US battlefield area intelligence so lacking or non-existent? Uh, the, well, there are two reasons. One reason was MacArthur didn't want the CIA anywhere near Korea. Uh, so the real intelligence analysts and what they were doing from World War II, uh, the descendants of the OSS from World War II, they weren't allowed in the Korean theater at all. So uh, anything that would have been really good usable tactical intelligence associated with any good strategic sense uh, was off limits. So you, you didn't have that kind of dependable intelligence that you really should have had because the CIA, the professionals were involved. And then the other reason was simply the fact that uh, MacArthur didn't want anybody but yes men around him, especially Willoughby. So what was going on uh, were the, the sergeants and the lieutenants and the captains, they were talking to the colonels,
colonels accepted what they would say, and the colonels talked to the major generals. Major generals knew enough to depend upon the colonels. Everything is fine so far. Major generals talked to the corps commanders. Corps commanders said, let me take it to MacArthur and Walker. Uh, Walker th thought we should probably think about this, but that's where it stopped. Uh, anything that was coming from anybody who could actually see combatants was ignored in Tokyo. Uh, all MacArthur wanted to hear was Willoughby, and Willoughby was telling him what he wanted to hear, which is that we can get to the Yalu and the war will be over by Christmas. So it's a criminal failure, not just of intelligence. People knew what was going on if they were anywhere near the ground, but of the concept of what intelligence was there for, not to massage the ego of the commander, but to, to save lives and to do something that made tactical strategic sense. Biggest failure, uh, as far as I'm concerned, of the 20th century before uh, the weapons of mass destruction failure of 2003. Anything else on Zoom, Susan? Well, yes. Have you? So have you, Dan, um, written a book or published any articles describing the Battle of the Gauntlet? Oh, no, but uh, I'll tell you uh, oh. who you could read. Oh. Uh, this guy uh, at the University of Nebraska uh, wrote a master's thesis on the battle. And this is a very good source because he was able to talk to veterans of the 2nd Infantry who were living around there. And he saw a bunch of people out in the Midwest. And his name was Robert Bruce. And you can find his master's thesis online, which uh, will give you a lot of anecdotes from the Battle of the Gauntlet. Uh, and then the other standard account was written by famous historian S.L.A. Marshall. Right after the war, he was an official historian. And he, he wrote an account of the Battle of the Gauntlet, which was called the Battle of the Gauntlet. And he, I think he published it in 1953, the very last year of the war. So those are two of the, the, two of the standard accounts but uh, I haven't written anything uh, on my own now. Okay, next question. Bill. Yes. First, no, hang on. We have to. We have to. Oh, you have to get the microphone? Yeah. Go ahead, When Truman went to Wake Island and relieved yeah. MacArthur, what was the feeling among the men? Uh, well, I think they could probably answer the question better. Uh, my understanding was uh, the infantrymen uh, never held him in very high esteem. Uh, but I could be wrong about that. Anybody want to chime in on this? How did you feel when MacArthur was relieved? This was uh, early 1951. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to know about that. Yeah. Uh, he, he never spent one evening in Korea. He was always in Tokyo. Uh, but my, my impression always was that that wasn't a big deal if you were somewhere in the trenches. Somebody has the uh, but, uh, but, but the really good thing about that was you, you all know who uh, replaced him was maybe the best U.S. general of the 20th century, Matthew Ridgway. Uh, and Ridgway was the one who put the line back together south of Seoul, got the guys back on the attack. Absolutely superb combat commander. Couldn't have asked for a better guy, opposite of MacArthur, as far as command responsibility is concerned. Uh, and he took command of the 8th Army because William Walker, Oh, everybody called him Johnny Walker. His, his uh, jeep went off the road. He died in a jeep accident on a frozen hillside in Korea. Ridgeway takes over the 8th Army, changes everything, and uh, eventually goes back on the attack. Okay, Phil, you're next. Um, you, you, this last question stole my thunder. Oh. I was going to say, has forgot the been accredited for anything? He has screwed up more things oh, yeah. the more I read. It, he's, <laughs> He's got book learning, but practical learning, he's a dud. He, he, he had his moments, uh, had his moments in 1942 and 1943 and 44, I, I think anyway. But the guy who really nails him on Korea is David Darvistan. Uh, so everybody should read The Coldest Winter. World War II, mm -hmm. he lost the whole Air Force that was left after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, uh, so, so well, the, the retreat from the Chongqing River there's a big argument, was that the greatest US military defeat for the army of the 20th century? The only competitor, of course, would be the, the retreat from Lingay and Gulf to Bataan in uh, late 41. And MacArthur had something to do with both of them. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, the failure to supply his troops. Yeah, he did the same thing in the Philippines. Yeah. Bob Hoosier, customer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I just have some a comment. My husband was in the 9th Regiment. He was? And uh, from the beginning, and I'm looking at the, the whole issue from the uh, average GI's perspective. Uh, they had absolutely no training. Uh, I think uh, his, his regiment started uh, from Fort Lewis, mm -hmm. Washington. That's right. And I think they got the alert on July 9th and 50. 
by August 16, imagine, half around the world, they were in combat. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, his, his company, uh, Strands was 90 instead of 180. Yeah. And uh, they, they pulled together uh, GIs from all over the country. None of them, he said, had any military training. They didn't know how to shoot guns. Mm, and, and, not good. and my husband uh, on, on the Navy ship um, engineered a, a shooting practice where they threw uh, crates overboard and then he taught them how to use the guns uh, to, to shoot at the crates. So uh, I, I'm looking at it again from a larger perspective. There seems to be a tendency in our nation to, uh, to reduce the military, to reduce strength, to de-emphasize training all, all over again. And it is the GI that ultimately has to pay the price for that kind of neglect. Yeah, there, there, there was awful neglect of, of the Army especially before 1950. Uh, but I think your, Army did, your husband did pretty well at that target practice because the remarkable thing was how well the 2nd Infantry did when they first got to Korea. Uh, they were helping to defend Busan uh, around the Naktong River. Uh, and they were one of the reasons the North Koreans didn't break the line. Uh, so somehow they were able to pull it together quite remarkably. But they, they got no great help from the Department of Defense in Congress, that's for sure. Okay, next. Um, I was reading from, uh, about Charlie Arango. Yeah. I was reading uh, about Charlie Arango, and it, uh, he said that, uh, that while they were in the gauntlet, helicopters were flying out <coughs> generals and even colonels. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I, I don't know anything about episodes like that. I haven't read that. I didn't. He probably would be a pretty good source, but uh, I, I haven't come across that particular account. Because now Colonel Peplow and Colonel Freeman, uh, and I, I think you might remember the, the, with the Colonel of the 9th Regiment, I'm pretty sure they stayed with their men. But I, I haven't heard anything else about officers being helicoptered out. Maybe they, maybe some are wounded. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna tell a funny story. My husband was on leave then. He was in Korea. Yeah. Hold the and closer, please. Right. Closer. Okay. I'm going to tell a funny story. My husband was Armenian, he was in Korea, and it was an Armenian picnic, and Kennedy was running for president, and my little mother-in-law ran over to him, get him out of the battle, get him out of the battle. He wanted the Armenian vote. So in a week, there was a note that said, Mr. Russian, go report the so-and-so and go, and then go to the kitchen. He was a cook. He didn't know anything about cooking, and he just said he threw chocolate chips in him, and the guys loved it. But that's, you know, that was, Kennedy did that for a boat, for a group of boats, and I'm wow. very interesting. Yeah, it did happen. Thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, first of all, MacArthur, from, from World War II, they referred to him as Tug Out Tug mm -hmm. because he had evacuated Bataan and went to uh, Australia. So he did, have a, did not have a good reputation with the infantry. Mm -hmm. To Edith uh, Flint's point, Pat Flint told me the same story. When he was leaving Fort Lewis for uh, Korea uh, in, in early 1950, men in the 2nd Division uh, from Fort Lewis, many of them hadn't gone through basic training. Mm -hmm. They had not fired a weapon. She's quite correct. Mm -hmm. And that's so, the United States Army did that in Vietnam, taking draftees, putting them through 16 weeks of training, and then they found themselves in the jungle. So it was, it was a bad lack of training. Meanwhile, we had two highly trained divisions, the airborne divisions, the 101st and the 82nd. They never left they, the States. They never went to Korea, right? And they didn't go because right. they were ready to go to to Germany when the balloon went up, when we went That's to right. war with the Russians. So mm -hmm. they were never deployed. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. that's right. Okay, more questions. Anything on Zoom, Susan? No. Well, we have thanks again, Dolly. Going already. once, going twice. Any more questions? Oh, oh, there's one. We do, we do. Here we go. Almost. I knew they'd be in the group too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a tremendous presentation. Uh, my question is, because we've been talking around the periphery here, do you know the overall status of the armed forces after World War II, other than the forces oh. in Germany, I'm under the impression that everybody was just, you know, exhausted, that 
uh, there was very, very little stateside training done. And that was mm -hmm. kind of the, the overall consensus of not only the politicians and the army leadership itself, but also the population. They, they yeah. didn't want to be preparing for another war unless you were in Germany, you know, it was take it easy and, and just recover from that. Is that? Yeah, the, uh, Congress slash budgets was the easy thing to do. Uh, there, there was really a, an awful lack of preparation after 1945. You know, we, we demobilized very quickly, which is understandable, but there, there was no serious attempt to build up the kind of sustained permanent military that we would need if we were going to be a serious deterrent in the Cold War, not until after 1950. That's one of the things, that, things the Korean War did, was make us begin to take that seriously. But the worst story of all were the, the guys who actually had to go right into Korea once the North Koreans crossed the 38th parallel. And those are the guys who had been in Japan. Uh, the 24th Division, they, they did almost nothing at all by way of training. They heard lectures, uh, they hung out at uh, you know, sushi places, whatever they were doing. But there's hardly any training for anything like combat. And naturally, they were broken up. And it was bordering on criminal to put them in harm's way based upon the training they got in Japan. It was a very, very slack occupation, and, and they paid a terrible price for it. A, a terrible price. Yeah. Okay. I think that probably does it. So, I think we all agree we've had a wonderful presentation. Let's give Dan a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we look forward to bringing him back again, and who knows what war he's going to talk about. He, he, his specialty was the Civil War. I believe he told me once his actual favorite thing to talk about is World War II. But you ask him, we called him up and said, can you do something on Korea? We haven't done that for a while. And he said, I'd love to. <laughs> so it, it, we cannot stump him. He, he will do anything we ask him to. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. So thank that was, we're, we're thrilled to have him. Um, folks, we are going to um, take a summer hiatus. There will be no program July and August. We will return in September. Our program is going to be domestic terrorism, how the threat of international terrorism has morphed. And our greatest national threat is now domestic terrorism. And it will be, one sec, it will be brought to us by Edith Flynn. You want to raise your hand, Edith? Yep. Edith is a, a retired professor emerita of Northeastern University, and her specialty <laughs> was terrorism. So we're thrilled she's coming out of retirement to give us a fresh look at terrorism in September. Marion, did you have a question? Uh, the first Monday in September is Labor Day, but our meeting is the second? We meet the second Monday of the month. It's the week after Labor Day. We're all said it should not interfere with Labor Day week. And you will hear from us in time and we look forward to seeing you again in september have a wonderful summer thank you so much for a great afternoon we appreciate it and this concludes our program everybody thank you again good afternoon